Hello and welcome to another episode of Launch Legends. Today we're joined by Nick of Visitor Q. Nick's company is currently doing around $35,000 in monthly recurring revenue and growing at 10% every month. Nick, at the age of 25, almost makes it sound easy how he grew his company. But the truth is he really had to grind to get where he is. Nick openly shares how he grew his company in phases. But before we continue, if you're listening to this on a podcast, please rate and leave a review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, rate and leave a review. Hey, Nick, thank you for being on the show. So let's start with uh, telling us who you are and uh, how you came about with your product idea. Yeah, my name is Nick Hollinger. I'm the co-founder and CEO of VisitorQ. VisitorQ is a B2B system that allows you to identify the companies that are visiting your website. We do this via IP address reversal, and we're currently working with about 5,000 companies across the globe. Uh, To put that into context and give an example of what that looks like, so if you were to sell, let's say, cybersecurity products to other companies, Mm -hmm. you would want to know which companies are on your website so you can follow up with the, on average, 98% that don't convert. Mm -hmm. So we allow you to do that, uh, and we work with uh, mostly B2B companies but in North America, but generally uh, we're spread out fairly across the globe. Uh, where I come from in my background is I studied marketing in school, uh, graduated from there, went to the traditional route, went to go work at an agency. And at that agency, I watched uh, the CEO win small business of the year and the company win small business of the year, but the CEO give a, a speech on the stage. And at a, I was probably 20, 21 coming out of school. I realized I wanted to be up there and not down, not down in the crowd. So that's when I decided that I wanted to go into entrepreneurship because I wanted to be, I wanted to look like that. I wanted to be like, that. I don't want to be able to give those speeches. And it, had, it coupled with my hard work ethic. I come from a, a family that was pretty much paycheck to paycheck. So I always had to have a job. Uh, interestingly enough, I had a, my first job when I was four years old. I delivered newspapers with my eight-year-old brother. And I did that until I was 14 when I got a job at McDonald's and then McDonald's all the way through college into uh, graduating college and, and working at that agency. Mm-hmm. After that agency, I went to go work at uh, another company. So I didn't make the leap into entrepreneurship right away, but it really planted the seed. Mm-hmm. So I went to go work at a B2B small business uh, in, in London. And that's when on the side, I started to build Visitor Q. And Visitor Q really came up after being at that B2B small business company and seeing the struggle with conversion rate, mm-hmm. seeing how can I help the sales team develop mm-hmm. more leads and really and really help grow the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've since left that company uh, after building VisitorQ on the side for just over a year. Oh, Nick, yep. how, did, how did you start working on it? Did you hire a developer or did you start coding yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a, a non-technical founder. So mm-hmm. I, when I, I brewed with the idea for a month or two, and then I started reaching out to individuals I knew to actually... Uh, to develop it that that had the technical capacity and I would pay them. And then I eventually approached someone and they gave me a quote and I said, okay, what if I just gave you equity instead? Mm-hmm. And that his name is Taraz and he is our, uh, our other co-founder and our CTO uh, to date. And uh, he built the initial, the initial platform. Uh, we pushed it out and uh, he's still with the company today. So, so let me ask you this. So you started working on the product. Um, I know you had a private beta uh, where you reached out to people and got them to use the product. Uh, how soon did you actually give the product to them? What was the condition of the product when you gave it to the beta users? What did you- <laughs> it was, uh, I'm not going to say hot garbage, but it wasn't great. It was, it was an interest. So we, lo- we pretty much started building June of 2017. By September of 2017, we had something that was workable. It did the job. It did the it did the bare minimum. So mm-hmm. we pushed it out to, I think it was fifteen of my friends, colleagues, peers in the industry that were working at B two B companies that they could set us up on their website so we could identify their traffic. Mm-hmm. In a month, a month and a half on that private beta, we worked out some kinks. We made it 
uh, not so much garbage, but better. It, we, we made it better to the point where we could launch to more of a public, uh, to, a, to a public beta. And we launched in a public beta on Product Hunt. We launched, we, we messaged people on LinkedIn, sent out email blasts to cold lists. Uh, we did a number of different channels to try to get users onto this free public beta. Uh, we ended up getting about 2,000 or so users to test it, give us feedback, identify where the bugs were, and so on. So, Nick, um, when you said 2,000, first of all, how long did that take you to get to 2,000 users? That's a lot of users. And what was the most yeah. effective channel for you? Pardon me? Say the last part again. What was the most effective channels, uh, channel to get you those 2,000 customers uh, users? Uh, Product Hunt was definitely, so I'll start with the, 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 the latter. Product Hunt was definitely the most uh, beneficial for us. We were testing our marketing channels at the same time, so that was incredibly beneficial. We could rule out paid LinkedIn and different marketing channels, but also rule in ones that were effective. But Product Hunt overall drove the majority of those signups. Uh, and then uh, by the end of, it took us about four months, December of 2017 to uh, April of 2018, uh, we had about 2,000 uh, users in that time. And at that time, we launched into a full paid product. Well, where uh, we Nick, gave, sorry, I'm stopping you. Yep. Okay. Uh, four months. What did you learn about the product or the user base? Did you have to change the feature set or did you have to you know, change, pivot anything uh, after talking to those 2,000 customers? Not users. So there were tweaks. Yeah, there were tweaks that were definitely done. There weren't any major features. It was mostly just patching uh, smaller bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there weren't major tweaks. There weren't major features launched in that time that were needed, absolutely needed. What we did do is for the product, for the paid launch, is we came up with three features. And I remember one of them off the top of my head. I don't remember all of them. Uh, we came up with three features where it would be an incentive it were, they weren't absolutely needed, but it would be a greater incentive for the, uh, the, the beta testers to convert to a paid plan because we're now offering this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we launched the, those on the same day that we launched our paid product, mm -hmm. and uh, it helped convert some of those beta users to the, to the paid product. But one thing about beta users, uh, you said you, you, had, you managed to get 2,000 beta users Someone's someone who's listening to this is thinking, oh, okay, did every one of those 2,000 beta users start using the product or you had a very small section of uh, those users who use the product? What was oh, your very problem? small. Very, very small. Uh, 2,000 is, I guess, impressive as a number, but it, the conversion rate wasn't uh, exceptional. And there is, I, I, I do not believe that's our issue. When you launch a free product, Mm -hmm. Everyone and their dog will come sign up for it and, and try to use it. It's not, uh, you're not getting a qualified data set like we do with our free trials now, uh, where we have targeted marketing, you have to sign up, you have to put a free trial, you have to do a number of things to be a qualified user. And we're getting more qualified users now. But mm -hmm. when you're on a, when you're on that free beta style, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to end up with a, when you convert to a paid product, a smaller conversion rate. So of those users, I would say, 30 to 40, maybe 50, ended up becoming paid users. Of our and how many, how many were actually using the product? Let's not talk about uh, the paying, paying customers. How many out of those 2,000 actually used the product? Currently or were at the time using it? At that time, at the time, beta users. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but my guess would be around uh, 60 to 70% were actually active users every month within the system. Oh, wow. That's still very good. That's still very good. Yeah. So let's talk about your Some numbers. Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, so let's do, yeah, you finish and then let's talk about your paid plans. So some of those, uh, they were smaller companies, so they were fine. We also introduced a free plan uh, as well, uh, so they could get five uh, leads per week. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of them are, that's all they needed. So that's all they, so they continued to use the system, but they didn't actually need to pay to upgrade, right? Right. So you launched your paid plan. What happened after that? Uh, we've been growing fairly steadily since we're uh we're at about 35 or 34,000 in MRR currently uh mm -hmm. we have about 5,000 uh websites or companies signed up to the system mm -hmm. and we've been growing about two or three times uh year over year five or five to ten time or five to ten percent month over month so uh, growth has been steady we've obviously had to move into different channels of marketing than we were using with the, the beta. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're heavily within Google AdWords mm -hmm. and SEO and content creation. I kind of group those two together mm -hmm. to, to drive our leads. We also do some Quora. We do a mixed bag of things, but definitely AdWords and SEO are the big drivers right now. Right. So with AdWords, how much is it costing you for a free user? Uh, for a free user? Yeah. So Someone we spend about... Yeah, so I know the blended uh, blended across, but we spend about eight thousand dollars currently on AdWords. Okay, but do you know average cost per user? Uh, so cost per free user? Yeah, uh, I know the blended number with the rest, but if you know, let me crunch the numbers quick. Uh, so you're looking at about eighty eighty bucks per uh, user free user that it drives us. Free user. And what's your conversion rate? Uh, so about 15% currently. Right. And was that 15% to begin with, or did you have to work on your onboarding and you have to do any tweaking? Uh, so that is pretty much the optimized right now. That is the, the optimal uh, percentage that we've been able to get to. Uh, we've, we've seen 5%, we've seen 10%, we've seen, now we're at 15%, we've seen that growth. And it really comes from, as you mentioned, onboarding. So we onboard, we try to onboard as many users as possible. We invite them to demos, we invite them to onboarding. We created a bunch of resources around their use case and so on. We have a very thorough email uh, chain that goes out once you sign up. Uh, so a lot of that conversion did come from the onboarding side, but also improving the product. So being bootstrapped, we didn't have a hundred grand to build the perfect product right off the bat before we launched. So iterations is how we did it. We, we gradually improved the product. We launched what we could for our budget and then said, okay, we're, we're going to deal with what we have and slowly make it better. And now we're at a point where we compete very well but we're still iterating on the product every day. What's in the plan in terms of features and uh, growth in the next couple of years? So you've done extremely well getting it to you know, 34K per month. That's really great. But what's, what's in the plan for the next couple of years? Yeah, so uh, integrations. So we're looking to integrate heavily with the other CRMs and drive users based off of their marketplace. So we're launching Salesforce in a, in a month or so, being in, actually within their marketplace and being the first one in our category to live natively within Salesforce. So you won't have to sign into Visitor Queue and sign into Salesforce. Visitor Queue will be a widget within Salesforce that will uh, help our users not to switch between. And then beyond that, additional integrations that we can grab users and, and drive users off of their marketplaces. What's the plan of the integration? Do you have commitments from those uh, integration partners that once you do that integration with them, they will promote you? Or it's just a matter of you integrating and then putting it out there on the marketplace, hoping that you will get some users? Uh, so there, it depends on really depends on the integration partner. Salesforce they do offer a lot of assistance when you when you launch. They'll they'll help with your marketing material. They'll help push it out as much as possible. But there's a lot we can do on our end as well. We, we've written 15 to 20 different articles around Salesforce, mm -hmm. so that we're our name is uh, when people search for how to integrate. Google Analytics with Salesforce. We're, wanna, we're getting up there in the top results there. And other articles around Salesforce that uh, our name is now included to help drive users that way as well. So a push and a pull method in regards to Salesforce. And I know HubSpot offers a lot of mm -hmm. the same support and, uh, and marketing that, uh, that others do. So once we get there, we'll figure out what those marketing initiatives look like for each one. So Nick, uh just imagine someone who's listening to this. You, you're almost making it sound very easy that you just started three years ago, put up the product, um, <laughs> beta, launch, beta launch, you did the public beta, then you moved on to uh, you know, getting 30 or 40 customers straight away, and then you got to 34K. It wasn't easy, I know that. And, uh, no. If you, had, if you were to start all over again, and imagine you, someone's listening to you and you that person, what would you do differently? Uh, I want to start by saying it's not easy at all. It is likely the hardest thing I've ever done. And if I didn't have uh, the support system, if I didn't have my fiance in my life, it would have been a hell of a lot harder. Uh, definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. So if you're thinking of going into business, absolutely try it. Just know that it is not, it is not easy at all. Uh, day to day, 
probably one of the hardest things you and it's going to keep getting harder. It, it doesn't get easier because you keep pushing yourself. It's this endless cycle of the, once you figured something out and you that doesn't stress you out or make you anxious anymore, you push yourself to the next, you add a zero, you add, uh, you add another task that you're unfamiliar with and it mm-hmm. makes it even harder. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that foundation there. Uh, and actually my, the, the one thing I would do differently was not be so hard on myself. And that might be coming from an age of, or a, a, uh, the, uh, a hindsight, it might be coming from hindsight, but I was very hard on myself the first few months when we were making two, three grand, four grand. I think I had something in my head that we were, we were going to be bigger than that quicker. When, when you say you were I hard was, on yourself, what do you mean? What were you doing? Just working at Tino's? Were you doing something just, else? Uh, no, I, I don't mind doing that part. I was, I think, mentally hard on myself. Like, oh, this is never going to work. Like having those doubts and, uh, and mentally exhausting myself mm-hmm. by, by being tough on myself and, and questioning my own decisions, right? And looking back, I think I've learned to not take everything so seriously. Uh, entre- entrepreneurship is tough as is. So mm-hmm. at least be a cheerleader for yourself as you go through it. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you have... If you if your business fails, your family will still be there. Your support system will likely still be there. So you have a fallback. So let's talk about your failures. I'm sure you went through a ton of failures. You haven't talked about them. Let's talk yeah. about a couple of failures where you thought, okay, that's it. I'm going to fall. That's it. I can't okay. talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so the worst one, uh, we got, it was like a one-two punch. COVID set us back a little bit, but the, the one punch uh, came in about February of this year. Uh, we were initially built on top of Google Analytics, and that was a decision that I made to build it on top of Google Analytics, and we were reliant on Google Analytics. They made a change to their algorithm that completely shut down our system for five days. Um, and not because five days they changed the algorithm back. We had to rebuild our whole system in five days. Mm-hmm. And that was the time where I think I got punched in the face the hardest. I would, yeah, it was metaphorically. Uh that was the time where I think that was the biggest failure on my part. It, we were reliant on a system that we shouldn't have been. That is a failure in my mind. And at the end of the day, the buck stops at me. So I can't blame Google. I can't blame anyone else that, that the buck stops at me. And mm-hmm. that change really was a fit. The, the fact that we were so reliant on them was a failure in my books. And mm-hmm. that was likely the biggest one because it almost... We went from having revenue and this massive growth to essentially nothing because we didn't have a product again. We had to rebuild the whole product. So that was likely my biggest failure. What did you do? That, that must have been quite big. How did you get around it? Uh, rallied the team. <laughs> I sat down with my co-founder and I said, we have four options. We can sell our customers to our competitors. We can shut down completely. We can rebuild or we can pivot. And we went with the, the rebuild of the, the system. Uh, we ended up removing the reliance on Google Analytics by building our own tracking script and our own analytics system. It took five days to get pretty much an MVP out there, which allowed us to save, I think it was 90% of our customers. Uh, and then we were able to, since then, optimize it to now we're, we're back at growth and we've made up for that loss that, uh, that occurred. Great. So I'm actually all over the place. Let's go back a little bit even more. Um, yeah. When you first started out, I'm sure you were all excited that you're building a product. And then you did your beta launch, your private beta, and then your public beta. First of all, how were you funding it? Uh, I know it was a side gig at that time, but still, was it? Did, were you making enough money to fund it? That's one thing. B, how did you even get through that period? Because a lot of people give up at that stage where nothing is working. Uh, customers are not, well, users are not happy. They're swearing at you. Or even worse, not, you know, you've got beta users, but no one's using the product. Uh, how did you get through the phase? That must have been probably one of the toughest phases uh, you know, out of your journey. Uh, so completely self-funded. So the, the the former there, completely self-funded. Pretty much any savings that I had from my job. I was, I'm still in student debt, but I was able to... Student debt here isn't in... in uh, it's government-sponsored. It's government-backed. So it's, uh, it's actually pretty good debt to have. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. So instead of paying off my student loans, I put that money towards starting a business and it was completely bootstrapped. Uh, To date, we've got some grants from the government and one private loan and a loan from the government as well, all under 150,000. But, uh, and that's, and we still have cash in the bank now because that 
part of that 150 is still in the bank going towards marketing and and scaling R and D and so on. So completely bootstrapped, just creative ways of piecing together five grand here, 20 here, 75 here, and just little pieces of funding as we could. And just being very diligent with that money. So I think I like to class myself as uh, I think my fallback's marketing. So if I ever get really screwed, I can do something that's heavily marketing based uh, or, or a company that's heavily marketing based. Uh, so I like to go towards ROI driven marketing. So if this dollar isn't making me $3 in a month or two months or three months, then I'm not spending that dollar. Right. <laughs> the, the example I give is your, your startup doesn't absolutely need t-shirts right away because uh-huh. they're not going to produce, they're not going to produce $3 in, uh, yeah. in, in two months. Uh, so that would be uh, the first part of that. The second part I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think I'm stubborn to a fault. My my fiance always says that uh, says I'm very stubborn uh, in a good way though. I'm reasonable, uh, but if I set myself to something, I'm stubborn, and that's where I don't I don't give up, and I and I can't really uh, I can't really let myself give up, and I think that's what got me through those beginning the beginning part and and uh, and pushed me beyond that. Great, Nick. Thank you for being on the show, and uh, it was great to hear your story. And uh, I know you're still 25. You started very young, and your company is making 34k a month, and it's growing every month. So, in no time, you'll be making a ton of money. So, it's really great to you know get young people like you to basically share the story. So, thanks once once again, and I uh, hope I see you again very soon. All right, cheers. Thanks for having me.